I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Banking terrorists, suicide bankers. It's a plague. What do we do about them? Stacey Harper? Yes, Max. Apparently, some capitalists have bought the rope to hang themselves with. It's come true. J.P. Morgan's bet against J.P. Morgan. Apparently, J.P. Morgan hedges the spread on its own debt. When investors bid up the yield, an indicator that they think the bank won't pay, J.P. Morgan makes money because they've taken a bet against themselves. The bank reported $1.9 billion in revenue and bets against itself. Right. That's right. The bank is manipulating markets. That's true. They are trading on insider information. That's true. They're using credit default swaps invented by their very own Blythe masters to engorge themselves on illicit gains. That's true. They're bankrupting the country that they operate in, America. That's true. Jamie Dimon's apartment is now being surrounded by an angry mob looking to lynch him. That's true and justifiable. So J.P. Morgan is an unqualified financial terrorist, and this proves it. They, this is just one more example of bankers using markets to blow themselves up. They're suicide bankers. Now, we condemn suicide bombers in the Middle East, for example, or in other places around the world, or Timothy McVeigh. But why no condemnation for Jamie Dimon? He's a suicide banker. Why? Well, in, during tough economic times, you see over and over, during the housing crash, what would happen? People have insurance on their homes. And if the, they could either sell it at 50% markdown, or they could burn it and collect 100%. So if the U.S. economy is dead and it's not coming back, and the only hope that J.P. Morgan could have is like a few fees on food stamp cards... Well, maybe it's better for them to just burn the whole thing down and collect the insurance. Yeah, well, that's, that, that's, that's a point well taken. So the, the analogy to the housing market would be the arson scam of collecting the insurance and burning down your house. So Jamie Dimon has decided, what you're saying here, is that the J.P. Morgan Bank is worth more to him dead than alive. <laughs> well, apparently, they've so made killing, a lot of revenue from it. They're killing their own bank. Yeah. They don't care if they kill their employees or kill the country. They don't care. It reminds me of a few months ago, we covered a story, I think it was Paul Ryan or Eric Cantor, was double short U.S. Treasuries. That's right. That's right. One of the politicians, I think it was Eric Cantor, who actually made a huge bet against the U.S. Treasuries and then actively was trying to pass laws that would hurt the American economy. Well, he passed laws when he was voting against raising the debt ceiling. So that would cause his portfolio of a double short against America and the U.S. Treasury market to uh, rise. That, that's the problem. I mean, everyone in Congress is effectively a day trader. They've made positions against their own country. They're highly leveraged, and insider trading for congressmen, by the way, is legal. Not, people don't understand that, but for congressmen, you can trade on inside information. There's no law against it. So, again, you know, Occupy Wall Street is out there. It doesn't matter. The banks continue to c commit fraud against everybody. And here's the next headline, Max. Wall Street sees no exit from financial woes as bankers fret. Yes, the poor bankers are fretting. Betting against themselves isn't just enough. They're manic depressive people. One hedge fund manager is quoted here, I don't think it's time to make money. This is a time to rig for survival. Another finance guy says, they're not going to make the kind of money they wanted. I'm not sure people really have come to terms with the fact that what we had was a financial bubble. Well, the use of the word rig is interesting. I mean, a lot of these hedge fund managers are sailors out there in Greenwich, Connecticut as well. Is he saying he's rigging his sales? to deal with this economic catastrophe that they created? Or is he saying, in our day-to-day -day operations of market rigging, we need to rig these markets for survival instead of rigging these markets for growth? Well, I believe it's the second option here. <laughs> and this is a good proof that the hedge fund community, which is the tail wagging the economic dog, so lives entirely on market rigging. Look at John Paulson. He was part of the market rigging two years ago. He made billions on the collapse of the mortgage market. This year he's lost billions because his market rigging 
didn't work out the way he thought it was going to work this way. Well, because they cracked down on it. This was he, he had a direct relationship with Lloyd Blankfein and Goldman Sachs. So he he was shorting Goldman Sachs's CDO packages on U.S. subprime. He shorted Goldman Sachs's credit default swaps against Greece. So he was able to have that inside information of what was going to blow up before it happened. This year, they're now cracking down on Goldman Sachs when they had to go in front of the Congress and, and admit that they were uh, selling crappy products to people around the world, and they were intentionally blowing them up. Right. Well, so here's John Paulson. He's got a trillion-dollar credit line. He makes massive speculative bets two years ago on the collapse of America's economy. Uh, this year, he makes bad bets. Uh, the capital never actually went to work in the economy to support growth or jobs or legitimate GDP growth. All that resulted was a huge round trip for that capital minus John Paulson's billion dollar fee. And that's all that happened. And the point is, I think these protesters want to know, is, is that treasonous? And of course the answer is, is indisputably yes. The fact is, it, it doesn't matter because it's continuing on. As this article continues, Neil Borofsky, the former special Pro inspector general for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, said, quote, I wouldn't shed too many tears for Wall Street. The systemic advantage that the too big to fail banks enjoyed in the lead up to the financial crisis may be diminished in the near term, but the structure is still essentially the same and will almost certainly help catapult them to record profits and bonuses once the good times return. That's true. The system, as we described it, by just spinning money through the laundromat that is the New York Stock Exchange, creates enormous fees for the money launderers. Look at, again, Wachovia, uh, involved in a near $400 billion Mexican drug money uh, laundering operation. They paid a, a very little fine. $160 million fine. That was it. Um, so is that, is there anything in place to stop that from happening? No. No. Well, okay, Max, you mentioned Wachovia. Wachovia was involved. They laundered $378 billion for the Mexican drug cartels. We know that. That's a fact. It's only stated, but never any investigation, no criminal investigation, no time for one single person involved in this. It was all accidental, $378 billion. They paid a $160 million fine. This week, we've also seen a hedge fund manager sentenced to 11 years for making $75 million worth of ill-gotten gains on insider trading, which every single day in the market, $100 million is taken from pension funds, from small Joe Bag of Donuts investors through high frequency trading, which is the, essentially insider trading. They step in front of all trades, all pension fund trades. They see what you're about to do, your pension fund on your behalf. They rig it to take from that. And so how is that any different from insider trading? I don't understand. Or the, the Bank of New York scandal. This is now coming to the fore. They apparently have stolen something on the order of $400 billion as well from pension accounts by engaging in look-back trades, which I've explained on this show several times. Uh, and they won't even allow the case to go to court, even though uh, the prosecutors are anxious to go to court. And they have been caught red-handed stealing billions of dollars, Bank of New York. Again, is that a crime against humanity? Of course it is. Well, the markets decide, Max, and the markets are, are not pricing in any real long-term effect at all on Bank of New York Mellon. So that is not going to happen. And you can count on everything continuing as such. Taxpayer nursing, huge losses on RBS and Lloyds. Three years on from the bailouts and instead of the profits expected, market meltdown and bank regulation means the taxpayer is sitting on 32 billion pound paper loss. Yes, it's the regulation and the market meltdown caused by regulation that is making the taxpayer who own us, the banks, Royal Bank of Scotland and Lloyds. You guys are sitting on a 32 billion pound loss on a 60 billion pound investment in these banks. Well, let's roll Erin Burnett and that clip with she's down on Wall Street in the Occupy Wall Street. And she talks to a protester there and she says a bald face lie. She says that the taxpayers made money on the bailouts. Play clip. So do you know that um, taxpayers actually made money on the Wall Street bailout? Uh, I was not aware of that. They did. They made, not on GM, but they did on the, okay. on the Wall Street part of the bailout. Okay. Does that make you feel any differently? Well, I would have to do more research about it. But, um, if I were right, it might.
That was a lie. That's not true. It's, as you just pointed out, th these have been a catastrophe. No, banking apologists always say that the bailouts made money because they selectively look at one or two that did. All Look at AIG, however. Look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We have lost money time after time after time. Look at the Fed's balance sheet. There's trillions and trillions of dollars of bad debts on those books that we're not allowed to look at in too much detail. So what the heck is on there and how much has yet to be revealed? Or use generally accepted accounting principles when looking at any of these banks and you'll find out that not a single one has paid back any amount of money to bail out people. Only if you accept as the hedge fund we talked about market rigging is the way to go. If you accept fraud then you can put on the blinkers and make a fraudulent statement, as Aaron Burnett clearly has committed, uh, made a fraudulent statement. So let's look at the real economy. We're talking all about the bubble economy, the fake economy, the banking economy. We know that's rigged. We know that's a fake game. We know it's, it's not real. Now let's look at what they're, in America, they're trying to do to recover the economy. Florida lawmaker wants to repeal dwarf tossing ban to create jobs. Bill Workman, a Republican state legislator in Florida, said, I'm on a quest to seek and destroy unnecessary burdens on the freedom and liberties of people. All that it does is prevent some dwarfs from getting jobs that they would be happy to get. In this economy or any economy, why would we want to prevent people from getting gainful employment? Right. Uh, it's come to this, that uh, the way to uh, stimulate the American economy is to legalize dwarf tossing. Speaking of dwarfs, Max, let's move on to the next headline. Have Geithner fly commercial to help cut the deficit. So this is Barney Frank, and he's looking at ways to cut the deficit. And one of the ways he's saying is prohibiting Treasury officials from using military air transport, a practice begun under former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson and continued by Geithner. It could contribute to reigning in the deficit. Each flight of this kind costs at least $150,000. So you could apply. This is like a shovel-ready project, Max. You take Timothy Geithner, a dwarf, and you throw him across the country for a flight. It saves money. It employs a lot of people across this the is, country. This is interesting. This is like a combination of that um, uh, Islamic practice where they have money going around the world. So this is a combination of hawala and dwarf tossing involving Tim Geithner. So if Tim Geithner wants to go from, let's say, to New York to L.A., then he has to be tossed from person to person to person in a chain from New York to L.A. This would give all those people jobs. Tim Geithner would not be spending the taxpayer money. And uh, if it works out, we can toss them around the world. And he wouldn't have any time to screw up the economy by advising Europeans how to in in introduce Eurotarp. Well, Stacey Herbert, scintillating as always. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Well, we'll be back in a moment, so don't go away. Max Kaiser, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to one of my all-time favorite cities, Beirut, Lebanon, to talk with Dr. Saifdin Amous. He's a visiting scholar at the Center for Capitalism and Society at Columbia University and lecturer in economics at the Lebanese American University. Saif, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thank you for having me, Max. Your latest piece is called 
Lubaric's odious debts. What is the definition of an odious debt? And how much did Mubarak leave behind? The definition of odious debt is uh, debt that is incurred by a regime that is not representative of the population it borrows on, whose, uh, whose behalf it borrows on. So um, if, a, if a dictator or if an authoritarian government borrows a lot of money in the name of its people and then uses that money to repress those people or to enrich itself, under international law it used to be that such debt would not be repaid by the successive governments. Um, for some reason, this is not a concept that people talk about a lot anymore these days. Um, and when governments are replaced, it's considered that uh, the successor governments need to honor the obligations of their uh, predecessors. And now is probably a good time to start uh, bringing up this topic and uh, making governments responsible themselves for the debts that they incur and not burden the populations uh, with repaying that debt, especially that that debt was used to repress those populations rather than to help them uh, advance or to better their own economic situation. All right, now during the rev revolution uh, in Cairo, of course, one of the major um, talking points, if you will, was to uh, not comply with any IMF debt imposition. Uh, now, uh, several months after the revolution, the IMF and World Bank loan packages uh, are being rumored to being now accepted uh, in Egypt. Your thoughts? There was a very positive sign after the revolution, which is that the new government, the interim government, uh, particularly the military uh, rulers, decided that they didn't want to take the IMF and the World Bank loans. So it's a positive sign that the Egyptian government turned down these loans. It looks how, like, however, they're being mooted to be returning to the IMF and to the World Bank asking for those loans. Nothing has been confirmed yet. Um, there's been various sorts of reports about it in all sorts of different uh, media outlets, but it has not been confirmed confirmed yet, but uh, a lot of people are thinking this is, would be a good thing to do right now because borrowing from the IMF and the World Bank it comes at a lower interest rate than borrowing from the domestic market. And uh, considering that the uh, budget of the Egyptian government is being strained a lot by how much uh, payments it has to make and by the decrease in tax revenues, this is beginning to look like more and more uh, of an attractive option for uh, the uh, people in charge of Egypt today. But, you know, it's, it's still not clear what's going to happen because of all the political uncertainty and the economic uncertainty in the country. It's not really clear what, what, what this will lead to. Well, the initial interest rate from the IMF, of course, is the teaser rate. Uh, once they've got your, their hooks into you, uh, then a, a lot of bad things tend to happen. Let's talk about uh, the role of uh, corporatism in political and economic unrest, uh, whether in the Arab world or in the rest of the world. Uh, for that matter. So this, the role of corporatism or neoliberalism or the Washington consensus, uh, do you see much of a future for that or is this global uprising uh, going to uh, reverse that trend, do you think? Well, I mean, if you, if you want my opinion about the ultimate underlying economic causes of the revolution in Egypt and in Tunisia, I would think it is the system of corporatism. It's, it's usually, uh, people usually talk about, you know, the problem with Egypt and Tunisia was free market capitalism going rampant and going crazy. The problem was that they introduced all those free market reforms with the World Bank and the IMF, and that is what led to all these economic crises. I think that's a quite inaccurate way of putting it, because what Egypt and Tunisia had um, before the revolutions was by no means a free market system or a capitalist system. It was a, actually a textbook case of corporatist system. And by a corporatist system, I mean a, uh, the sort of classic example of that is interwar Italy, um, Italy under Mussolini between the First and Second World Wars. Under that sort of economic system, you have a government that is very, very, very heavily involved in the uh, workings of the private economy. So it's not like socialism where the capital and the productive enterprises of society are owned by the government. You do have private ownership. However, the government plays a very important role in directing production within that economy. Now, under corporatist systems, what ends up happening is that a few a powerful interests end up capturing the important positions in the big corporations and in the government. And that was clearly the case in both Egypt and Tunisia leading up to the revolution. The real problem with this is not just that they enrich themselves. You know, obviously that's bad enough that the people like Mubarak and Ben Ali and their uh, associates became very rich. The real problem from this sort of system is that 
it closes the opportunities in the face of all sorts of normal people in the country to be able to advance economically, to be able to fulfill their potential, to be able to have productive careers and to have good jobs. This is the real problem of corporatism. And I think the problem of Egypt and Tunisia was an economic system that was repressive of the needs of the people in the country. It was an economic system that didn't allow people to reach the potential that they saw for themselves. And I think that's why people revolted. Now, the second part of your question about where this is going, I think it's, um, it's still really up in the air right now. I'm not entirely sure how things are going to go, but I think there's a positive sign, which is that um, the clout that the ruling regimes had over economic activity is being softened. The, they have less control over, over economic activity than they did before those revolutions. A lot of the most important figures in the corporatist regimes of Tunis and uh, Egypt have either fled the country or they're in prison. So a lot of the ways in which those regimes were able to suppress their people economically are now breaking apart in one way or the other. It's not completely over, obviously. The Tunisian example is going a little bit better than the uh, Egypt uh, case, but I'm slightly optimistic that things will continue to improve and that totalitarianism will be weakened more and more in Egypt. All right, so Saif, uh, you're, you're headquartered in Beirut. You just finished up your PhD at Columbia University in New York, so you have a good understanding of what's happening in New York, I would imagine, with the Occupy Wall Street protests, which have modeled themselves on Occupy Tahrir Square. Uh, the Cairo uprising. Uh, are these two similar? Uh, where are they not similar? And how would you compare and contrast these two protests? There are some similarities, but there are also some differences. I think uh, similarities, um, what I was talking about in terms of the corporatism of the Egyptian and Tunisian economies, I think to a very large extent applies to Western uh, economies as well. If you look at the way the United States government has been acting over the last few years, um, there's clear evidence that you know the, their economic policies have been to the benefit of well-connected firms and banks and to the detriment of the average American. And I think it's also true in the case of, the, of Europe. So in that sense, you know, it's good that uh, you, you're witnessing that people are just not lying down and taking this. Uh, uh, they're standing up and they're rising up. But you know, there there are many many differences, and I think. Um, um, there are some worrying trends about the way that things are going in Occupy Wall Street and in some of the uh, other uh, European countries where people you feel are missing the point sometimes when they talk about the importance of redistribution or as they talk about raising taxes as the uh, solution to this because if you think that you know everything is okay with the system but you know what needs to be done is just raising the tax rate on the rich people, then I, I, I think you have a very big misunderstanding of what the problems uh, really are. It's, uh, the question is not about taxing the rich, the question is about uh, taking apart the system that makes some people be, uh, have the ability to become rich at the expense of others. There's nothing wrong with being rich, there's something wrong with being rich through illicit means or through means where, uh, where government support or government bailouts were involved in enriching uh, in, in, in enriching those people. So um, to focus on, you know, raising taxes on rich people, I think, is completely missing the point. And the real worrying thing, I think, in Occupy Wall Street, which you're beginning to see over the last few days, is that it is probably going to be co-opted by the mainstream political establishment. So you've already seen people like Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama talk about how they are on the same side with the protesters. And, you know, if they're right, and, you know, if a lot of the protesters continue to be... Um, sympathetic towards the sort of Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama take on things, then you can see this degenerating into something like the Tea Party movement or something like the anti-war movement. Um, let's remember, you know, back in 2002 and three and four, there was a strong anti-war movement in the U.S., believe it or not. Um, and that anti-war movement is what gave us Barack Obama. He rode the crest of that anti-war movement. But by the time he came into office, he was indistinguishable from uh, George Bush when it came to uh, wars. Similarly, you know, the Tea Party movement uh, is now probably going to give us another um, presidential candidate who's very similar to Obama and Bush. Rick Perry. Uh, so if, you know, if, if the Occupy Wall Street movement ends up being co-opted by people like uh, Obama or Pelosi, then obviously it's going to have been a big waste of time. Um, but, you know, hopefully, hopefully something better will come out of it. To summarize two key points that you're making here, uh, you're making a distinction between corporatism and capitalism, something that a lot of people wish folks like Michael Moore would understand a little bit better in their critiques. You're also saying that it's um, not a good idea to focus on the 
distribution or redistribution of wealth per se, but to understand and to focus on the underlying systemic risk and the and the institutionalized looting that's going on in the system. Now, let me ask you uh, one last question, Safe. Um, the Occupy Wall Street. Um, what if you could go down there and write on all their placards just one phrase or one concept to unify them, or you had a chance to manage them down down there? Uh, what what would be your message? Um, you know, I I really don't know. I think. Uh, um, I'm not American myself, so I wouldn't want to be presumptuous enough to put myself in a sort of position of to be uh, preaching to Americans about how they need to be uh, fixing their economy. Yeah, but, but uh, safe, safe. Let me cut in. Let me safe, 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 safe. Let me beware, beware of being co-opted. Safe. Let me cut in here for a second because it's not just an American issue. This is a global issue because the banks are operating in a globalized context, and we've seen what happens in countries like Cairo and Egypt when they become a client state for American banks, and now American banks have run out of poor Egyptians, so they're attacking Americans. So it's a global problem. Um, so your, your suggestion is don't be co-opted. Is that, is that correct? Definitely. The, the, the most important thing is not to be co-opted into part of the political system um, and you know, to learn from the experience of the anti-war movement. And uh, one other thing, as a goal, I think um, the best thing that could happen to Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Europe and the U.S. at this point would be a complete separation of state and corporations. Uh, the states should just completely stop dealing with the big corporations because it is under the pretext of regulating them and under the pretext of uh, ensuring the safety of their transactions with consumers that governments intervene on behalf of those companies, on behalf of those big companies, and then end up um, using these interventions in, a way, in ways that are counterproductive and not helpful to the uh, population. So it's always, it's, it's always done under the pretext of, you know, looking out for the little guy, but in reality it always ends up um, causing more problems than it solves. And that's, that, that's I think, the, the uh, problem of corporatism summarized. Okay, so separation of corporation and state. And I would imagine one of the first things to do along those lines would to take corporate money out of politics. That's all the time we have. Thanks so much, Safe, for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me, Max. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Safe Dean Amus. Uh, if you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.